quickly welcome everybody. For those of you watching, you might be watching on YouTube, you might be watching on LinkedIn, you might be watching on Facebook or Twitter. We're talking about PhDs. Should you do one? Should you not do one? If you do one, what does it mean? What is it going to cost you? What do you have to put into it? What do you get out of it? There's so many questions to ask and we've got the right people around the room to answer that. Right, so we're going to be talking about PhDs and we've got David Stuckler. Am I pronouncing your surname correctly, David? Because I, like, <laughs> I've always just called yeah, you David until German right now. Name. Stuckler, but I don't go with the Omla because people can't figure it out. So okay, all right, good. That, thank you for that. And so I mean, this, <laughs> this is the first time we've had that conversation. Thank you for that, David. David is going to David. Let me just tell you about David, and David's going to blush a little bit, but I'm going to say it. David, when in terms of talking about PhDs, he is the real deal. It's not just David; it's Professor David. It, he did his MPH at Yale. He did his PhD at Cambridge. He was a professor at Harvard, a tenured professor at Oxford. He's now living in beautiful Italy, more than 350 publications in peer-reviewed uh, uh, peer journals. So definitely the real deal. If you've got questions to ask, he's the man with the answers. He's also got an interest in this, by the way. He does a lot of mentoring, and I wanna, actually, I wanna hear more about that. He's got a whole program, program mentoring people, doing PhDs, getting into the space, helping them along. So he's a real, like a voice of reason in this space. So he's the right person to ask the right questions. Then we've got our regulars, Kale and Yavna. And what's interesting about the three of us, the three regulars, is we all fit into very interesting categories with respect to this question about PhDs. So y Yavna, you're doing a part-time PhD at the moment, aren't you? Yeah. Right, you're doing one. Kale is the not for me, never want to do one. I'm in the not for me, never want to do one, but I'm kind of interested in this idea of an MD, which is a medical doctorate, which is kind of like a soft PhD. It's, for, it's PhD for people like me. You know, it, get, it, it allows you to get into sort of an academic track in universities if you wanted to, certainly in, in countries like Ireland and the UK. And I don't think that the same facility exists uh, in other countries necessarily. Sorry, my phone was ringing. I just need to put that over there. Um, okay, so before we carry on, for those of you watching on uh, YouTube, uh, remember, you can subscribe to this channel. Uh, you can obviously like, you can write. If you put comments in the comment section, we'll try and get back to those. So those might be questions that you have. You can also, so other than subscribing, you can become a member of the channel. And in actual fact, for this particular for this particular video, we've actually invited the members to ask questions and we haven't opened up uh, questions to absolutely everybody else. The members, the members of the channel also get access to information and videos that I create about jobs and employment in the global health space and in the public health space. So that's what the membership's all about. Go to the channel, find out more. Uh, we'd love to have you be part of that. And we also, on the membership uh, page, you get access to a web page that gives you current listings of jobs that are available in the global health space and in the public health space right now. So definitely do that if, if you're interested in working in global public, global public health. Now, um, let's just, I'm gonna start off just with a simple question and then, and then we're gonna get into other, other issues, but and 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 Kale and Yavna, I think you guys might talk about some existing job opportunities in the global health space that pertain specifically to people that have got PhDs. So we're going to give we're going to talk about that as well. So that's going to inform this conversation. But I'm just going to start off with a question for David. David, who who definitely should do a PhD? So we, we'll talk about who perhaps shouldn't and you know etc. Just now, but who should do a PhD? Who's the person who it's a slam dunk? If this is you, you should be doing a PhD. End of discussion. Boyashaka, do it. Right. Excellent, Greg. It's easier to actually say who should not do a PhD um, because it's not just the inverse. But usually if I separate the people who are going to go on, do their PhD well and get on a track for success, they usually have some co things in common. They're, they're motivated. They're action takers. They're not procrastinators. They're comfortable working alone. They're also comfortable working in groups. They have intellectual curiosity, the kind of people who just want to know who want to go deeper, push the boundaries farther than others. Uh, good, because that's, and, I mean, I want to go shallower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if I can go shallower. Can, that, uh, then they have the right reasons for doing a PhD. They are not just parachuting themselves into a potentially toxic lab or unknown environment that they're not prepared for. No, they've done their homework. They know what they're stepping into. They know they're not stepping into a race. They know they're stepping into a marathon, a big in time, energy, and costly investment into their future. Uh, and they've defined what success is going to look like. So they know they're going to get the most out of that investment that they're making. Can I just ask you this, David? 
and, and actually I'm going to follow up and I'm going to ask Yavna the same question. At what point did you know that you were going to do a PhD? Did, did the idea kind of trickle into your brain? It's just like, oh, that's a nice idea. And then it kind of grew from there. Or did you wake up one morning and you was like, I'm going to do that? Or did you meet somebody that was working in academia and you sort of thought, that's what I want to do? How did you get into that space where, okay, I would like to do a PhD. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become sort of this, this you know, world-renowned academic. So at the beginning, I, I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to help people, but I wasn't sure how to, to go about that. I wasn't sure how I could use the talents that I had to best serve others. And so uh, what I did is I was prepping for medical school. And at the time in the US, you've built up your CV, build up your application. You do a lot of things to show medical schools, hey, you're gonna you know, win a Nobel Prize in medicine and do great stuff. Um, so I was shadowing doctors, getting some clinical experience and just so it happened to pad my cv i started doing research and uh there's this model in religion in the 18th century that people converted in religion by actually doing it uh that was kind of the case with me when i started doing research i realized hang on wait a second as a doctor i can help the patient right in front of me but when i do research i can start dealing with the broken u.s healthcare system i can start dealing with medicine of entire I, i'm not talking about sick individuals I'm dealing with entire populations who are ill that I can help. And that's when I knew I wanted to, to do a PhD. Okay, good stuff. Yavna, over to you. PhD, how did you, how did you, because you're doing it part-time, which by the way, is extremely brave. I mean, doing it at all is brave. Because um, I, I won't lie, like the idea of doing a PhD has occurred to me at times, but whenever it has, it's, it's, been, it's been associated with sort of shivers down the spine of fear of you know, actually I'd like undertaking such an enormous commitment. But there's people that do it and people like you, Yavna, that do it part time. So I'd be very interested to hear about how that came about. Well, um, I always expected that I'm going to work going to work in education. Like when I was going to elementary, I wanted to teach at elementary. And when I was going to high school, I went and when I was at my university, I wanted to teach at my university. So after I finished my master's, I was like, let's do a PhD. That's how you go there. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. um, you know, like how life has many paths that go <laughs> all the way. So I ended up working at the uh, clinical trial industry right now. So, but yeah, I, I always like, I was always interested in research and I always wanted to do things. That's, <laughs> that's why I do all, all that. It's because I want to and the only way to do it is to do it. <laughs> and and Yavna, would you see yourself down the line in academia? So you mentioned you like teaching and like clearly if you're doing a PhD, you've got kind of a bent towards research. So you basically have an aspiration to land up working in a university environment one day. Is that right? Well, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'd like okay. to, but we'll see whether that will work out. Okay. Okay. No pressure. No pressure. I completely understand. Uh, David, we've talked a little bit in the past about this notion of a PhD by publication. And the reason I'm bringing that up now is because having just spoken to Yavna about doing a part-time PhD, this PhD by publication does feel as if it's something that people who can't necessarily make the commitment to kind of carving out four years of their life to uh, you know doing a PhD, this might be a route in for them. Can you just tell us a little bit about what that is, what it involves, you know, uh, the, 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 the difference between a regular PhD and a PhD by publication? Yeah, really glad you, you asked that. So the whole idea of a PhD is that you're going to make the transition from being a consumer of information to producing information that pushes the boundaries of your field, infectious disease, epidemiology, chronic disease, health policy, whatever it is. Um, what the PhD by publication does is it, it, it captures just that. And where in a traditional PhD, you write chapters in a PhD by publication, you write publications. And so when you have made a contribution to the field as expressed by peer reviewed publications that have been independently vetted by your field, which is exactly what a PhD defense is all about, um, you can be awarded a PhD recognizing that, hey, you've passed muster. You are, you are a producer in this field. It's something that's not so widely advertised, partly because universities don't make a lot of money for it, but it is the most efficient route to a PhD. And it's like, why play in the playground with kids toys when you can get roll up your sleeves and start doing it? 
Um, so I'm, I wish I would have done that path, but it, it takes certain things to get right. Um, it can be very good for mid-career uh, professionals who already have experience. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's what I was thinking. That you've got a lot of mid-career people who would find it difficult to sort of stop everything, go back, uh, become a student again, if, effectively, and do a PhD. Whereas a PhD by publication does seem like a very appealing way, um, and it's, it seems sensible. I mean, you you kind of getting those publications out at the same time as doing a PhD. So I think that that's an extremely sensible thing to do. Now I'm going to take one second out of this show to, just to speak a little bit about Limerick University, and the reason is. I just want to say thank you to Limerick University. They're providing support for creating this and for support for this this YouTube channel, bringing public health teaching content to, to people all over the world for free. And I couldn't do this without that kind of support. So a big thank you to Limerick University. And just to let you know, the University of Limerick have an MSc in public health, which is absolutely outstanding. Okay, And the reason I know this is I know the people that have designed this particular MSc. I'm living in Ireland. I'm living in Dublin. And Limerick is is down the road, so to speak. And I've I've met with people that, in fact, I like that. You know, some of them came up and met with me while this MSc was being designed, and I was amazed at the thoughtfulness that went into thinking through this particular curriculum, how it was going to be that they de delivered the, the, the content, uh, the commitment to high quality teaching is just quite phenomenal. So I'm, I'm I am personally really impressed with what they're doing in Limerick. Uh, like giving them a wholehearted endorsement is the easiest thing in the world. Not just because I know and like them, but I really believe in what they're doing. They're doing, and in actual fact, they've de they de designed a curriculum that is specifically focused on making sure that the graduates are fit for purpose to get jobs in the global and international health space. I mean, they've really thought this thing through, almost thought it through from, from the end product backwards. Like, what do we want to produce? We want to produce people that are adding value and making a contribution in public health. What skills and competencies do those people need? Okay, and then let's build up a curriculum and a teaching modality and a teaching methodology around that, make sure we deliver that. And they're really they're delivering the goods. It's a relatively new MSc, so it's kind of quite an exciting time, but it's very quickly become very popular. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite a sensation. Um, I'll just give you an example. They've got five modules, and when you do these modules, it's you, you do most of the, the sort of learning work online, so you can do that from any, anywhere, and then each module is ended with a very intense uh, short burst um, uh, in in person uh, meeting where you all get together and you kind of really hash it out and you spend you spend a little bit of time in person with tutorials with your colleagues with other students and then you go back and you do the next module you, you do using this online process so it's a very kind of blended way of learning uh, so huge endorsement from me love it we're going to put a link in the description of the video below that you can click on and find out more if you want to and highly highly recommended okay now let's get back to talking about phds kale i'm gonna I, you weren't expecting this question so i'm gonna land it on you don't be nervous but kale uh, have you ever thought about doing a phd and then clearly you've concluded like i have look i'm not going to do that but can you talk us through my experience was, do I want to do a PhD? Okay, shivers down the spine. Sound, it seems too hard. That was my, that was my thought process. That's too hard for me. Uh, I can't. Uh, you know what I mean? I just, so, what, 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 what's your experience and thought process been like when confronted by the idea of a PhD? Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, there are a few PhDs that I had looked at and considered in the past and contacted people about and. They mainly spoke to me because they were in a, you know, a very niche field or something that was very interesting. And obviously, if you want to become um, an expert in a certain niche field, it's, it definitely seems like a good way to go. Um, but I guess the more I found out about, um, I kind of how much how much research base it is, and it's kind of uh, you know it's a, a way that most academics would take. Um, then I, I kind of shifted away from it a bit because I was enjoying kind of clinical work, I guess. Um, there is, in in keeping with all of this, there was all those factors about um, also like, you know, it is it is kind of what you've stated before, it's becoming a student again. Um, and then personally, I guess, reflecting on my own, my own background and my own strengths, I don't know if I have the attention to detail really to be, to really uh, succeed wholeheartedly at a PhD. So um, there were definitely ones I considered, but I just, you know, at, at no point have I kind of thought personally, at least with the kind of career path that I'm hoping for, have I thought that it's it's something I need to do. Um, and yeah, it, it, it just, I don't know, it speaks to me personally. 
Yeah, yeah, and that, that's you know the world's made up of all types. I mean, I'm uh, it's certainly in my career a PhD. I've never needed one, but I can sort of certainly see people in in my world that have done PhDs and and something that I wanted to bring up, David, and you you may you may have a view here, and and Yavna doing a PhD, you may also have a view. Skills. When I think of a PhD, you've got a person that's really hunkering down on a very specific research question, and at the, the end, of, and at the end of it, they draw some sort of conclusion. But it, it occurs to me that in that process, you're developing a whole lot of transferable skills that you can apply in other ways in the workforce. Now, uh, the obvious ones are like you, you, you're getting a, like a, a, a great understanding of the scientific method uh, and and how to do research, but are, can you maybe just speak to those kind of additional skill sets? When you leave a PhD, what are the skills that you now have that if you're applying for a job that doesn't necessarily line up specifically with your research question, but you're nevertheless skilled up to kind of add value and make a contribution, what are those skills? What are we talking about? Other than the obvious, like a nice person, you know, hardworking, you know, well, I mean, the hardworking one isn't, it, you know, like maybe that is part of it. You know, when you can say I've done a PhD, it really does say something about your ability to kind of hunker down and get something done. So, you know, that's, uh, so that is a skill. Absolutely, Greg, you just stumbled right into it. There are a range of soft skills that we don't recognize that are essential ingredients to having a smooth and successful experience to a PhD that are often rarely talked about and are often really neglected as part of the journey. So uh, what's one of those? Well, you highlighted on one of them is time management, right? We're used to as students doing sprints to finish an assignment to prepare for a test, but this is a big marathon, a big race. You have to set your pace, uh, small uh, chunks along the way that are manageable so that you can scale that mountain smoothly and successfully. And that helps you taking on much bigger projects and being able to manage complex projects as you go forward. Um, and another is writing. So often, unfortunately, we don't train students with writing and I see so many who get stuck and, and are inefficient and are just running around in circles because there's some basic things about um, structuring uh, an argument uh, in their research, making an outline, writing effective topic sentences, some really basic things that unfortunately just we don't have space in an already packed academic system to teach, but they can really hold a lot of people back if they don't get right. And these are transferable skills that will carry throughout your career. There are more of them. I could keep going, but I can see Giovanna wants to jump in. Oh, well, I, I don't want to um, interject here, but if I may, I also wanted to mention maybe so some sort of self-management because you're managing your own expectations and also like your emotions and frustrations because it can get like quite quite frustrating from time to time. I have no doubt. And, no and doubt. Um, yeah, and you're probably not gonna see that like for a, that's like a skill that's required in an open call, but that's something that's, if you l learn how to do that, that's going to be useful all the, all yeah, the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have absolutely no doubt that it takes a huge amount of self-management, managing your, managing your expectations, <laughs> dealing with disappointment. I mean, you might have gone down a whole stream of research and kind of run up against a wall and you kind of got to step back, rethink things you know, I, like I, I, I imagine doing a PhD is full of joys and heartaches that a person that's never done it could never, never completely appreciate and understand. Um, and and I, and, I, and I suppose when, when people with PhDs get together, there's that there's that sense of like, okay, we're part of a, a club that have been through the fire together in some shape or form. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit of that. Um, something that I've always wondered. Uh, in, in the context of like thinking about a PhD is how do you come up with that research question? Let's assume we've identified someone and they said, yes, I'd like to do a PhD. The, the career part that I have in mind, I'd like to be an academic in a university. I see myself going that way. I'm, I'm inclined towards research. I would be great. Now I need to think of, I've got two things I need to do. I need to think about a research question and I need to kind of find a supervisor. Um, how do you do that? Is that, I mean, is that, was that too broad a question? Mm. Yeah, uh, let me take that one. So you mentioned supervisor. I would go a step further and say, before you jump in, tr try to identify a mentor. Um, because really, PhD is like an apprenticeship system. It's, it's similar how doctors learn. Doctors do rounds and they learn from other doctors. You are learning a craft. 
And you need somebody who is willing uh, to take you under their wing and pass on a lot of those soft informal skills. And the students I see floundering around, they often, when they've gone in, they've gotten into a PhD program and they expect things are going to, there's a conveyor belt, they're going to fall in place, they get a committee, and nobody really takes responsibility for them. Uh, so you really want to have a mentor. And a supervisor is not a mentor. And this is a common mistake, an, an assumption that students make. There's a lot more that that you need um, out of that. Now, con once you, you can kind of think about, and I think about, I talk to people I work with about assembling a dream team of mentors um, to, to kind of help uh, help you on your path. Um, there are some effective strategies to reaching out to them uh, that I've developed uh, that I'd be happy to share with you. David, do now t t and tell us about your mentorship. You're doing something interesting, and it involves Facebook and online stuff and courses that you'd like. You, you've got a whole little thing happening to help people doing PhDs. Could you just talk us through that? Because I think it's a really interesting thing you're doing, and I think people will be super excited to learn about it. Yeah, and look, I made a lot of mistakes and had a bumpy road on the way myself coming from a small school in Texas. Um, you know, didn't my parents didn't know what a PhD was or even grad school. They're like, why aren't you going to work? What What's public health anyway? Um, going from there to becoming a professor of public health at Harvard and then uh, getting tenure and now living the dream in Italy. But what I, I did is I created a new well, program. Just the smile that he had on his face that he's living the dream in Italy. He wasn't kidding about that. <laughs> they pay him pizzas. I mean, guys, <laughs> can't, can't get much better than that. Um, but uh, I, so I created this program, Fast Track Grad, um, to, to help graduate students avoid some of the most common pitfalls in, in their journey and make sure they have a smooth and successful experience. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate is because I've had so many students come to me a month, two months before their dissertations or projects are done in a panic, scared of graduating, not uh, flunking out. And the sad truth is by that point, it's too late. You need to take the right steps to prepare yourself uh, in to make the most of this hard earned investment in your education, because you are sacrificing a lot to give yourself this gift of this valuable time. Um, and so that, that's why I created Fast Track Grad and create a lot of free trainings to help students go from zero to publishing in under 60 days. Okay, well, I'm going to suggest we, 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 we stick a link in the description to all of that. And if people are interested, it's not in the description at the moment. So if you're watching right now live, it's not going to be there. Uh, and it's just because, like, you know, we, we, we put this together quite quickly. Um, and I, and I, to be honest, it's my fault. I didn't think of that. But uh, we'll stick that in and we will make sure that gets into the description. And that, I think that's really important. Um, questions coming in from some of the, 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 the YouTubers, and these will be people subscribing to the YouTube channel that are, that are getting their questions popped up here. Uh, not subscribers, members. These are members. Uh, question, if I may, for Dr. Now, Stuckler, Stuckler. Yes. Uh, where, where's the umlaut said? Uh, I just finished my first year of a PhD in epidemiology and I'm struggling to gain publications. How uh, have you been so productive in your career? I must say, I'm interested as well. More than 350 publications. I'm delighted if I get half a publication. Can you get half a publication? No, that's a non publication. That's the story of my academic career. How did you do that? 350. That's yeah, crazy. To it's really interesting because I think a myth sometimes people think more hours equals more progress. And if people have worked in labs before, will tell you that is just not true. Um, one of the things that's really important in, in enabling yourself to, to break new ground in a field is, to, is setting a very strong foundation. You know, if you're going to build a house and really you building up your research portfolio and building your career, it's a bit like building a house. You know, the first thing you're going to do is make sure you've got a solid foundation because if you start building on that, you know, things are going to be wonky. The door's not going to end up where it's supposed to be. It's going to go a bit skew and eventually collapse. And the way you can set that foundation is a rock solid systematic review. And that systematic review is super important for many of you because it is going to make you an authority and an expert in your field fast. It is going to show you with your skills where can you can make the most timely contributions in the shortest period of time. And, you know, when I look at the path of a lot of graduate students, it looks like a, a bowl of spaghetti. You know, they're, they're all over the place, right? They, uh, you know, went to Frankfurt Airport and then they went down to Rio and now they're, what are they doing in Sydney? Um, where if you develop a master roadmap and plan that, that can emerge at the earliest stages, uh, you, you, you can go much more, I'm not going to guarantee you're going in a straight line, um, but 
you are going to have that North Star that's orienting you in the right direction to what your goal is. And if that goal is publications, it's going to make you a lot more fast and efficient at getting to that goal. Okay, thanks very much. I'm just going to whip through a couple more questions and comments that have come from the audience. Uh, Renata says, I'd like to know more about a PhD about publication, please. So we've talked about that. Thanks very much, David. Here's a nice comment uh, from Diane. I agree with the MSc Public Health at UL, University of Limerick. Thanks very much for that. I'm sure UL would be delighted to get, be getting these more endorsements. Another comment, uh, there, another one, <laughs> another <laughs> one about the University of Limerick. So there you go. Uh, can, can I book in, Can I book in something on that PhD by publication? Because it yeah. is quite new and it's not a pathway that's fully advertised. Um, usually you want to get about three to four publications that are in a coherent area, just like your chapters in a PhD would be, and you stitch them up and you, you then uh, submit that for a PhD by publication. You write an introduction and a conclusion to it, and then you go have a traditional defense. So... The fastest route possible for some of you who already have publications, you can potentially get there in as little as six to 12 months. Um, and for others, right, if you get the right mentorship and support structure in place, you can do this part time. Uh, but you need to have the right mentors to, to, to guide you. It, it's very it would be very hard to do on your own. Yeah, oh, without, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about jobs in, in the public health space or in, I mean, there might be people watching this that don't work in public health. It might be from some other discipline that you're thinking about a PhD. So we, we, we could try and address that as well. But jobs in a non-academic world. So let's assume you're doing or you've done a PhD, or you're thinking of doing a PhD, but at the same time, you don't see yourself working in a university environment necessarily in the long run. What are the, the other options? I can certainly imagine people with PhDs being kind of policy advisors, you know, kind of, kind of like weighing in on that, you know, like very intellectually with that detailed knowledge in a very particular area. I've always thought, but David, you can you can you can you can weigh in on this, and, and Yavna and Kale as well, um, that you'd be quite lucky if you found like a policy advisor job that mapped out exactly against the sort of research question that you happen to be doing your PhD in, you know, because. Uh, I mean, just statistically, that seems kind of like un unlikely, but I suppose it does happen for some people. But what, what are the other things that you might land up doing once you've got a PhD? So uh, a lot of a lot of my students uh, in PhDs wanted to have real world impact, and they face this very dilemma: Do I want to go down this this high work, low reward uh, academic track? Um, or do I want to go and really do real world impact and work for an institution? I say my students are about 50, 50 split, uh, between those, um, now to really succeed and break in, especially they're interested often in NGOs and UN institutions like the world health organization. And if you want to break into those, this is not something you want to wake up with in your third year and say, oh, I'm not really sure this academic things for me. Maybe I'll go work in WHO. Just that, that that's, that's probably not going to work. Those jobs are highly sought after. I remember when I did my first internship with WHO, I was able to get through because a professor had set up a collaborating center there and linked me in. And the very first job I had was to prepare rejection letters for everybody who did not get the position that I got. Now, WHO probably wouldn't want me talking about that too openly because they want to have a trip. So are you you're just among friends now. No, 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 please, hope, hope no, 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 but I, I've done it too. My students, right, I've set them up with WHO internships. And the PhD, you have the gift of time uh, for yourself that you can use and you need to use effectively to break in already then to these institutions. Uh, and there, there are some right ways and, and some wrong ways to go about doing that. Okay. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I'm going to ask Yavna, if would you just talk through a little bit one of the jobs that you've identified out there at the moment that is uh, available to people that have got PhDs? Yes, sure. I actually thought of maybe sharing two, but we can start with one. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's do one and then the next. That's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, sure. So the first one I chose for today is uh, I chose it because it's um, early staged. So and I know that a lot of people here are just starting out. And so this is something that they might be able to do after they got just like a bit of experience. So um, the job is for OECD, 
uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And the position is a junior policy analysis, analyst, and it's in Paris, France. So, um, the center is looking for one or more junior policy analysts to contribute to the work of skills strategy project team. And they're working collaboratively with a range of countries that are implying in the OECD skills strategy framework. So they can build a framework and more effective skill strategies. Main responsibilities under this position is policy analysts and drafting, then project management, and then representation and dissemination of their work results and OECD. Um, ideal academic background is an advanced university degree in economics or public policy with a strong foundation in quantitative analysis and uh, statistics. PhD would be an asset. And they're looking for someone who has at least two years, preferably maybe more, but at least two years of experience in economy or public policy analysis. Um, which is acquired in an international organization, national administration, university, or a research institution. Um, in regards to languages, like the only one that's required is English, but maybe willingness to learn other languages, for example, French, would be an asset too. Um, and yeah, this is a full-time position and it's fixed for fixed term for one year, but there's a possibility of renewal. Okay. Okay. Interesting stuff. So, so that's a job that, um, th th that they mentioned in the terms of reference that there would be uh, having a PhD would be a, a, an advantage. And I think you see that quite often in jobs that are advertised. And I think it's part of the recognition of the fact that people that have done a PhD bring a certain level of rigor and a certain kind of understanding of like deep dives and they can, you know, um, th it does just take a certain kind of person to get a PhD done. And I think once you've done that, you've proven yourself in a certain kind of way. And um, then, like, I'll give you an example. I've got a lot of friends that did engineering. None of them work as engineers. Right? They all work in like the banking sector and do all sorts of other things. But it's because in doing engineering, you've demonstrated that you can crunch numbers. And then you, 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 it opens up doors in all sorts of fields where just number crunching is the name of the game. And engineers, like I've never met an engineer that works as an engineer. Well, I, like, I don't say never, I probably have, but I mean, it's, just, it, it's unusual. Uh, and I think the same, you know, so PhD graduates have demonstrated a skill set in a certain area, and then that, that's often applicable in all sorts of um, uh, nooks and crannies. Kale, you had a question that you were going to phrase, if I remember, so I was just looking at the chat. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I've, I, a few, quite a few people are asking, so I'm kind of asking on behalf of a fair few people here. Um, this is for Dr. Struckler. Um, basically, how do you approach mentors? How do you approach professors? How do you approach super or pr prospective supervisors when you're thinking about doing a PhD or a certain project with a certain professor or, or people looking into the field? What would you recommend for those sorts of people? That is a great question. You know, as a professor, I get so many people coming to my door knocking and be like, hey, David, please, can you help me with this? Please, can you help me with that? They're coming as mendicants, like beggars saying, help me, help me, help me. And, you know, at a certain point, you do want to help people, but you can't help everybody. Uh, and so you really want to do flip the script on this. It's a strategy I call vesting interests. You want to instead come with something in your hand to offer. Um, which is kind of a radical shift in your thinking, but it could be to your professor say, look, I, you, your research on this really inspired me. A gentle flatter, stroking egos goes a long way because it so rarely happens for professors. Um, and your research is amazing. What can I do? Can I, can I, you know, I'm willing, I'm available. Can I work? Is there a way I can work in your lab? Can I do some research for free? Um, you know, I have external funding, so I'm not asking you for money. Um, can I help you with this literature review? Do you need help as a teaching assistant? There are all sorts of ways to break in. And what you've done is you are subtly making their success in some small way a function of your success. And you, this is very, very powerful. And it is the opposite of what most students do. I've got, I've got a whole separate training on this. If you're interested, message me after and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, 
Okay, thanks. A couple more questions coming in. So that, that was actually, uh, and I popped up the question that was in, in, in the chat that Kael was referring to. He has another question that's come in from Fly in Amber. Um, hey guys, love the discussion. Love Fly in Amber, love the name, by the way, Fly in Amber. Very cool. Um, I'm not sure if it's uh, only about getting a PhD in healthcare only, but there's of course, but of course there is a business in healthcare. My question is about getting a DBA. Uh, I'm not sure what a DBA is. That a, is it? Could, could that be a doctorate in business administration, like an MBA, but a DBA? I think that uh, that's probably what that's asking. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody in 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 the room has any thoughts on that. So well, let, let me just jump on that because you know, in Oxford there's DPhils, Cambridge there's PhDs. Just other words, the key thing is you want to think about what do you want this degree for? What do you want to get out of it? And so many students I see, they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll go do, a, maybe I'll go do this DBA. Maybe I'll go do this PhD. And it's like, that looks kind of neat. And they go on the path and it's like they've just walked into this dark cave because they don't know where they're trying to get to with it. And what's sad is so many of them, they stumble around this dark cave for a while, they burn out and they don't finish. I mean, sad reality is about 30 to 40% of people start a DBA or PhD do not finish. And that's the US, UK. The wow. rates are even worse elsewhere um, that's a big number yeah it's a shocking figure to think about on the stream of people doing phd where i mean we're talking you know two out of every five of you will not complete um and, and that's a lot of time frustration lost energy lost money um you know so uh, you really want to go into that cave fine but you want to be able to see a light at the end of the tunnel you want to know what your success is going to look like and where you want to go that can change along the way you want to do it flexibly but at least you have your North Star guiding you from, from the outset. Okay, so more questions. Thanks very much, David. You read, and by the way, that DBA question, I mean, just my comment on that. Um, I've done an MBA, and I, I can tell you an MBA is extremely practical. It's about like, how do you get things done? And I think once you take that a step further and you start talking about doing a doctorate in business administration, you really are getting into the underlying science that underpins uh, business process. So you've got, if you go that route, uh, I think it's very similar to what we've been talking about in terms of doing a PhD in the public health space or in the life science space. A DBA will just take you deeply into that kind of the underlying sciences that, that underpin business process. And um, I, I, would, I would say you, you, you need to be interested in that. You've got to be, you've got to be you know, it, 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 but all the principles that we're talking about now, I think would apply in that space just as much as they do in the public health space. Um, in actual fact, before we push go on this, we were talking about the fact that who's going to be watching this. And for the most part, I think the audience watching today will be a lot of public health people because they subscribe to my channel and that's, but this is going to be on YouTube. People are going to be watching this from all sorts of disciplines. So I think it is the case that everything that we're talking about probably applies in almost any, uh, in, in almost any discipline, um, in, in any science, you know, obviously with the exception of homeopathy, because that's just not a science, uh, just by the way. Okay, let, the next question. Um, this is from Oslado, Osvaldo, Osvaldo, another cool name. Love it. Okay, and I'm probably completely, completely pronouncing it wrong, but I love it anyway. Uh, what is more important in your opinion, uh, choosing a good PI or a subject? PI, what is PI here? That's a, what is the PI? Investigator. Yeah. So head of, this is like the question of the topic or the head of the lab. And my money is always on a good PI um, because okay. they're going to be the ones who have the track record uh, of success. You look at their students who have come through and work with that PI and see where they go. And that's going to be you. You're, okay. Where you're going to be is going to be highly correlated to what's already come that way. I say that with one caveat, passion. You need to make sure that that PI is working in an area you're passionate about because it's a roller coaster. You're gonna have ups and downs, emotional ups and downs. And if you don't have that passion, it's gonna be hard to see it through, to keep that drive, to get out of yeah. bed in the morning. You're gonna be spending a lot of time in that space. So you better make sure you're comfortable and happy there. But I also agree with your answer, by the way. I think like that PI, that person, like that is a human being that you are going to spend a lot of time with. You're going to be you're going to be really going to them for advice. You want to really trust their opinion. They're going to steer you. They're going to be uh, like that. That to me does sound like an, an, a very important decision. So, great answer. 
Uh, here's a question. Uh, this is from Amar. I don't know if I'm saying your name right either. Again, cool name. Uh, like basically, if your name isn't James or Andrew, I'm going to think it's a cool name. By the way, you know what I mean. <laughs> so just just so that you know, I'm an, I'm like I, I, I'm I'm easy to impress with interesting names. Um, which PhD in public health will get us a job at the WHO or UNO? Well, I, let me just give a, a little bit of insight there, and then others can talk. Um, there are jobs at the WHO where there, there, there'd be a preference for a person with a PhD, and those are often going to be PhDs where or, or jobs where where it is a subject matter expert that they're looking for. Um, and, and so you'll find them and you can look around and it's basically, uh, you, you got the short answer to that question is you've got to look like look around at what kinds of jobs the WHO are advertising and you'll see the ones like the one that, you know, y Yavne just pointed out a job where they actually specify in the terms of reference that they're looking for somebody, preferably with a PhD. But it's going to be that like technical expert kind of job. A lot of jobs at the WHO aren't looking for the necessarily deep technical expertise. And so you need to kind of look for that distinction, right? So um, a lot of them are looking for kind of like, they, a lot of the jobs would say that they're looking for an NPH and then they're looking for a lot of kind of practical experience. The other thing is this, uh, WHO jobs, you're unlikely to walk out of a PhD into a job at the WHO because they do take the numbers of years of experience as quite a strict criteria for the different levels of jobs at the, at the WHO. So there's P1, P2, P3. If you're applying for a P3 job, for example, there's a requirement that you've got five years of work experience in that area. Four years and 360 days, you're not on the list at all. It doesn't matter what else you've got going for you. They're very, very strict about that. And the reason for that is, and I've said this before on, on, on these live shows, the first person that's getting your job application at the WHO is somebody in human resources. It's not the hiring manager. So writing a very convincing, passionate cover letter isn't going to get you past human resources. Human resources are ticking boxes and they've got a big pile. I mean, when we had uh, Jalise on the show and she was talking about the number of applicants for each WHO job, there's sometimes eight, 900 applicants for one job. So HR's number one job is to get that pile from 800 down to 10 because they only want to give the hiring manager 10, 10 CVs to look through. And the way they do that is if you don't meet every single criteria perfectly, you're off the list. And the number of years that you've spent working in a particular area is the easiest way to exclude you. And so, you know, just that's the big filter um, is the number of years. And they want it to be number of years of work experience in that particular area. It's not always I, like I actually sometimes disagree with the kind of hiring uh, strategies um, because I was once while I was working at the WHO I were stepped into somebody else's role what because they had left and there was a need and I was sort of acting in that person's role but then they advertised that role and um, I would have needed an additional 10 years of experience in that area to get that job or not, probably, no, probably an additional five years and I remember not really wanting that job so I wasn't bothered but I went to the, to, to the, to the director of human resources and I said to her like this is not me being bitter i don't want the job but i'm just telling you it would be easier and quicker for me to qualify as a brain surgeon than to be eligible to apply for a job that i'm actually already doing in here in the who like i could get a license to cut your head open before i could apply for this job and i'm already doing the job like i'm knocking it out the park and i'm, I'm, I'm like five years away from even being able to apply for it so you, you know what i mean and i said if you found someone that had only been doing that for 10 years and then they were still applying for this job, you've managed to, it's a race to the bottom. You've managed to actually find the village, village idiot because if they'd spent 10 years doing that and hadn't progressed from that onto something else, there's by definition something wrong with that human being. Like you literally have, a, you, you, so I and, I, and and she laughed. She said, you're probably right, but what can we do? These are the rules, right? Because the WHO exists within the UN framework and the, and the rules around hiring are set outside of their scope. So, uh, and I know on this particular channel, people often ask about WHO jobs. That's why I spoke about that a bit. But um, any other thoughts from other people on the panel about that particular question? Okay, let's jump on to another question. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba. Okay, how to approach professors uh, to be acceptable as a, oh, we've spoken about that. We've done that. Done, tick, nice question from name that I cannot pronounce, but thank you very much for can anybody else say that name? Kashuba. It sounds like Kushbu. a... Kushbu. Kushbu. Ragyasi? 
uh, look at this for a name. You know, you know what this tells me? I've got like the, the most interesting people in the world, like you know, uh, connected to my channel. I love it. Nice program. PhD by publication sounds interesting to me. Definitely, it sounds interesting to me too. Don't know that I have the courage for it, but I like the idea. What else have I got here? What about pursuing a non-academic, uh, pursuing non-academic writing like magazines, blogs? Any thoughts? So writing outside of the PhD. Um, is this? So this is uh, Clayton and Claytine. Uh, I wonder if they're asking like, if you've got a PhD, does that set you up to do writing in the non-academic space? Have you developed a writing skill? Or maybe this question is suggesting like that's an alternative career path, you know, or like writing in that space may build up some sort of um, a kudos that is also valuable in terms of your profession. I don't know. Any thoughts about that sort of thing? Anybody in the room? Yeah, I can maybe jump in here. Yeah, As you jump in <laughs> Yeah, I used to write for like magazines for I think like maybe six years of my life, and I used to actually be an editor in chief of one magazine, but it was like non non science related. It was just like a magazine, and I think like you can do that without any like specific career aspirations if you like to do it, and you can also like that can be a career aspiration because you have always like journalism. But if you want to relate it to to your PhD then I think maybe medical writing might be more um, a, a better match because you don't um, I think like it's important when you're doing like some commercial writing is to make it like really easy to understand not complicated not too smart because you want to um, translate ideas and knowledge and everything so even if you're like really educated and have a PhD you need to be really caref careful when communicating with the public because then your role is to inform and explain things that are already really complicated and difficult to keep track of because we have too much information around. Yeah, 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 very good. <laughs> next. <laughs> okay, next question. Naomi, Naomi, no, but somebody, Christopher. Uh, thanks for the question. Which school can I apply for a PhD by publication? Uh, David, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, the, the students I take on to work on this, um, we make a plan at the beginning which university is the right fit for which you can get a phd by publication because not all offer it and there are some that have will give you a smoother ride than others but there is a degree of choice there are different costs involved um and they ask for some slightly different things but to give you an example for example in the uk portsmouth is a good one uh limerick might might have one uh greg i should i should check on that um because they do have a great mph program um there there are a few in the us as well all have some slightly varying uh, requirements, just as with any other PhD. So it's important to do your research on that first. Okay, nice. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, so a nice comment here from Sabam Mondel. Uh, I believe a PhD is a good stepping stone towards research and development. And then a follow-up comment saying, uh, especially in the field of economics, uh, and I, I imagine that that's true. So that's a nice comment. I agree. I think it probably does kind of open up some uh, some doors and opportunities there. Um, now this is uh, now what is this name? Toho, Tono. I don't see my glasses. Tonya. Oh no. Oh, no. oh, there's a little there's a little thing above the end. It's, it's what like you're yeah, Tonya. Okay. Um, <laughs> good. I like it. Uh, check who's going to be your PI and talk to other PhDs. That's probably that's great advice. I think that's, that's probably advice. that's really good advice. Uh, and and um, how they like the group, good idea. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Don't stare blindly into the project uh, and resource provide. Very good, great advice there from from said Yavna. Oh, she are you frozen? No. Maybe. <laughs> uh, um, I lost you for a second. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. There's a thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. You're most welcome. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, now, you see, with these, I can't actually see the screen properly with those glasses on. i got to switch. I'm switching on to reading glasses. Oh, I can see you guys. Okay, that makes a big difference, actually. Uh, Musa, I can actually read now. That's probably, that's been my problem. Um, is a doctoral in health administration more suited for academic setting or places like the WHO? and other global health settings. So a doctorate degree in health administration. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna take a stab at this and say that it's probably a useful thing in either direction and it depends a little bit. So for example, if you, if by the virtue of the fact that you're doing a, do, a, a doctorate degree or a PhD, 
of course it's setting you up for possibilities in academia, right? It's gonna be very heavily research based. But by virtue of the subject matter, you may well be setting yourself up to be a really smooth operator in some sort of practical sense in terms of some sort of administrative or practical management uh, in, uh, uh, role. And you, so it probably is a good thing in both directions. It might depend on what your research question is and what it is that you sink yourself into in terms of, in terms of that, uh, in terms of your, your, your doctorate. And it might also depend, as David has suggested, who, who, who your PI is, who your mentors are, um, and, and how they kind of like make open up doors for you. But I think that's a good question, and it's one worth certainly thinking about before jumping into the sort of PhD environment. Um, I just want to see what other questions are on here, because I do want anyone that's a member of the, of the, of the YouTube channel to get a chance to have their questions looked at. Uh, are job opportunities available for public health master's holders, or is a PhD necess a necessity? Nowadays, many are becoming overqualified. There certainly are, if you've done an MPH, uh, there certainly is, there are lots of jobs that you can get out there you know, clock up a bit of experience um, and, and, and you're going to be fine. But I do think that if you've got, if you're that way inclined, PhD is a lovely option, but I wouldn't be doing a PhD and, and you guys can comment on what I'm about to say. I wouldn't be doing a PhD because you believe you won't be employable without it. It's got to be, I'm doing a PhD because I really want to, and this is really fits with who I am. And it will be a stepping stone to the kinds of jobs that I really would be a, be a good fit for. But don't feel as if I'm unemployable without a PhD. Um, I, like I don't think that that's necessarily the case. Uh, you, it, if you want to be an, a re, an academic, then 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 that is true. Like if you you know what I mean. Like like I I worked at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for two years as a, a clinical research fellow, but I knew that my time there was going to come to a grinding halt if I didn't do a PhD. So you know what I mean, and I have to take a decision. Am I? Do I see myself as a, you know, a career academic in this institution? And by the way, I did love it there. I mean, Alice HTM, it was just kind of one of the most exciting places to be. I absolutely loved it, but I did need to decide. Like, do, am I? And I, I spent two years there, and I had a great time. But am I a career academic? And I sort of concluded that I wasn't. Uh, and if I thought that I was, then then the answer to that question would be yes. You need a PhD to progress in that environment. Or I could have had the option of doing an MD because as a medical doctor, you can do this MD and it kind of allows you in those, certainly in the UK and Ireland and maybe other European countries, an MD would allow you an academic career in one of these institutions without a PhD. Um, but it's certainly not considered as rigorous as a PhD um, per se. Greg, let me just add to that because there yeah. are definitely some. I've uh, one uh, one of my students who went out and took a job at WHO in a, a P two level, and rapidly she realized that to get up to a higher level, she wanted because in WHO you don't get promoted up; you've got to apply laterally to different positions as they become available. Um, she wanted to go for a P four, um, but to get that, she needed a PhD, uh, and and for her the calculus was very difficult. Well, do I go out now and and start a new PhD and take time off just to prep, and then that position won't even be there anymore. Um, and she was an ideal candidate for uh, a PhD by publication because we could then, while she's in her current job, um, using some of the work she was already doing and lead author on publication, stitch that together, get the PhD by publication, unlock those higher jobs. Greg, exactly what you say is, is correct. Do not fall into this assumption that you need the PhD to pursue an exciting, to, to, it, that it is your ticket to an exciting career in global health because it, it, it's not. And there are many, many paths. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Nice comment here. Thank you. Please do this more often. We will. Absolutely. Uh, I love doing these shows, by the way. This is like my best time of the week. Uh, so uh, we'll do more of this. Uh, here we've got yes. I, I'm not quite sure what the yes is response to, but it's, <laughs> that, yeah, that, it's, so the, the, we say thank you for the yes. Uh, hang maybe, on, let's go back. Maybe I'm yes get... for the name. Ah, okay. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's for the best time of the week. <laughs> there you go, first time of the week, I agree. Uh, Ashid, uh, does doing a PhD in public health confirm confirms job in the University of the WHO? Okay, the answer to that is no, there's no guarantees in this world. Is it possible to get a job at an entry level after doing a master's in public health? The answer to that is yes. So just quickly, like getting a PhD or getting anything doesn't guarantee anything, right? I mean, uh, I think this question is really about that entry level job. And we've done other videos where we've talked about this. The entry level job is a problem that people are often faced yeah. with because 
how do I get experience for the job if I don't get the job to get the experience? I mean, everybody faces that. And there's no easy answer to that. Sometimes it means doing an internship or doing, uh, you know, working as a volunteer. I mean, I know that's not easy and sometimes people can't do that. They need an income because they've got families and things. Sometimes it means clocking up experience in whatever job you can find, like even if it's not the, job, the stream of work that you want to work in, right? Maybe it's not even in public health, but you, you can get a job clock up experience, demonstrate within that job that you've got a skill set, use that in the application for the job that you do want. Uh, and whatever job you're in, always be thinking about what skills am I developing right now? What competencies am I developing right now? How am I going to use this as a stepping stone to my next job? And have I got an idea of what that next job is? Or maybe not. Sometimes you might be perfectly happy with what you're doing, in which case, ignore that advice. But for the most part, what you want to do is you want to be thinking about what can, when, and what can I learn now? What are, what experience can I gather now and take note of that stuff because you want to bring it up in your interviews for your for your subsequent jobs. Getting that and the other thing about getting experience when you don't have experience, I've actually got a video on that on my YouTube channel, so go find it there. But there's lots of things you can do outside of the context of formal employment, right? You can start a YouTube channel, you can you know, uh, you can start an academic journal, you can start a blog, you can start a podcast, you can start an NGO. There's there's a whole lot of things you can do. I was once the hiring manager, I was trying to build up a team at the WHO and I was hiring uh, and I needed to hire a member of staff and we had a few candidates and the one that stood out had started a blog on the subject that we were working in and I just, it struck me that this person was deeply and personally committed to the subject matter, that in their own time they had started a blog and it, so it wasn't just nine to five, they were like kind of at heart and soul in the subject and that, that kind of, worked, that tipped the scales in my view, in terms of, of uh, her eligibility for that particular role. So um, so do stuff even if it's outside of the context of formal employment. Right. Greg, Greg, Greg let me just add yeah. to that. This extremely valuable uh, advice that I just wish more uh, of our students coming through university would get to prepare them. And I really appreciate what you said about making sure you're getting skills where you're at now. Because often what got you here won't get you there. And you need to take steps to actively invest in those skills and already know where you're going, not just kind of floating along like a walking zombie waiting for the next promotion. And you really hit. I mean, we're all here on, uh, on YouTube live. I mean, these digital skills, they're not being taught very well in our, our public health programs. I remember I got on Twitter. My professor was like, ah, what are you wasting your time with that for? Um, but you guys need to be a step ahead of that because digital epidemiology is a real growing fast field that we are, whether we like it or not, dealing with on an intimate personal level. So I really appreciate that push, mm -hmm. Greg, and the tremendous value you're giving people here on your channel um, to be really at the forefront of thinking in public health. Yeah, thanks. Now this, uh, this and, and I, I was interested when we were talking the other day, you were talking about the fact that uh, years ago, I started the journal Globalization and Health, and that was one of the journals which you published in all those years ago and like, you know, years later, here we are, our paths are crossing again. Uh, it just shows what a, a, a small world it is that we're living in. Uh, and I'm delighted about that. Okay, uh, Priyanaka, Priyanaka Koshia. I'm definitely Priyanaka. not saying that right. Uh, you know what's gonna happen? Somebody's gonna like take this video and edit out all of my mispronunciations <laughs> and create like a comp compilation video and stick that on YouTube and they're gonna get rich. That's what's gonna happen. Damn it. And I hope I haven't just given you that idea. Um, how, how do you suggest one looks for a feasible topic in our domain of interest? So finding that research question, we've talked a little bit about that, but I don't know if uh, Yavna or, or, or David, you've got anything more to say about finding the right topic. Yeah, let, let me go on that. So um, I already mentioned passion. You've got to have. You want to look for something that has a big debate. Um, and you want to go into in Google Scholar and you want to just start hunting around doing keyword search, see what's getting a lot of sites, see where action, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, an academic track here, see where the conversation is. And this can be important. Somebody, I've had students come in and say, I'm interested in universal health care. And by doing those keyword searches, they realize actually on this topic, I'm more interested in financial protection. And then narrowed it down by doing those searches, realize, oh, this conversation is on catastrophic health expenditure that and poverty. That's where I need to be. Um, so that's a normal process of really refining. Uh, we sometimes talk about the wheat and the chaff. You're refining the wheat from the chaff, getting to the really good stuff, that topic that's going to be high impact, high debate. A lot of times people just stumble into a topic. It's really worth taking that time, doing that due diligence to make sure you are in a growing 
engaging topic. So many people get in the car on a topic, just drive down the road, they get to the end of the road and they're like, wait a second, this is not where I wanted to be. So really glad you asked that question because it's something important to, to get right now. David, can I ask you, because I, I, I've never asked you this question, uh, what was your PhD topic? Uh, my PhD topic was on mass privatization and the mortality crisis in Eastern Europe. It was the worst crisis in mortality in a time of peace in the past half century. Um, well, before COVID, that, uh, that, that is. Um, and yeah, really fascinating natural experiment where you had countries together that were very similar in the Soviet Union. They broke apart. It was a rare experiment with entire countries. They took different policies, different reforms to their health systems, and ended up in very different places. And this rare natural experiment uh, with entire pe populations gave us the opportunity to learn a great deal about I actually the social was, causes of uh, health inequality. I remember that paper. I mean, you, I'm sure you published lots of papers, but I remember a paper from you on that subject in globalization of health. Yeah, you remember two, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. you said there was like an excess mortality of three million people or something. That, that one, that one was massive, and and one the the one Greg that really was uh, like a uh, a revelation for me was that that paper when you were the editor. I think it was back in 2009, 2008, 2009. Can a bank crisis break your heart? I uh, remember, and uh, it was just that that was the financial crisis, and everybody was talking about the finance, and I remember that people's health that. would suffer. Yeah, and I, it was like to drop this little bomb into the debate of evidence, like, hey, this people are getting put in harm's way, and suddenly yeah. I found myself mm -hmm. on primetime TV, and it, this was a revelation, realizing that look, doing a research paper, you can get yourself just armed with some data and basic statistics, you can change an entire country's debate on a topic, you can change policy. No, that, was that. that was profound. And, yeah, no, what, what is your PhD? What is your PhD question? Uh, well, I'm not sure like how to put it in a really simple question because it's a work in progress. But what I'm working at is actually a user experience when providing pharmaceutical services, like and user experience, like when it comes to patients, but also to pharmacists, because pharmacists in Serbia are going through a really like difficult professional identity crisis. So that's something that I'm working on right now. Okay, well, here's a question from a pharmacist, right? Should experienced professionals invest in a PhD as well? Is there an age limit? I'm a pharmacist with a master's working in a clinical research and I feel something is missing. So maybe you feeling something is missing. It means that you are one of those people that needs to kind of explore what David's been talking about. You've got that need, you've got the hunger. Something is missing in your life. Maybe it's a PhD. Uh, and, and the, the, is there an age limit? I would say no. I don't know what others think, but I'm pretty sure. I, I don't like to interject here. I think yeah, it's, right it's really great for experienced professionals to do a PhD because I felt like I rushed into it because I started my PhD when I was like 23. And I think the first year of my PhD was just like, Oh, help. <laughs> so I think it's really good when you're experienced and when you know what, what you want to do and what's your main interest. And also like you can still develop your skills that are important for a PhD during your experience that you had in your previous life or work. So yeah, I, I encourage that. Okay, next question we've actually dealt with it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Greg, can I just jump in to, to follow up on something? A really yeah, do, do. topic question and, and your topic, helpfully. Um, you said user experience and pharmacist. When you do a systematic review, uh, Greg, you'll know this, you want to fill out your PICO, your population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And just gentle nudge to say, looking at user experience and pharmacists, if there's, think about a bad outcome, informal payments, or lack of access or barriers to access or you know the things that are the bad so you see there's a having a really clear outcome is one ingredient in, in getting a well-defined feasible topic that is not going to take you 20 years to finish um just just gentle unsolicited <laughs> no, I, to help people to grip on feasible topics um thank you very good okay what are your thoughts about an online university for a phd program like uh, Capella University. Uh, I don't have any particular thoughts. I, I suppose that that's fine. So, just to say, watch out. There are some uh, bogus programs that will take your money and give you a certificate that is worth not even worth the tree that was chopped down. You know, to 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 print it on. 
Um, be very careful, University of Phoenix. Uh, you want to make sure these are accredited institutions. Um, in uh, you know, just like there are a lot of quack journals out there and fa fake conferences and things, there there are also some some fake universities. I don't know that in particular. Um, I haven't looked at it, but make sure you look very very closely before you sign up to anything. Okay, thanks. I think that's good good advice. Good advice. Be cautious. Uh, maybe slot into David's mentorship program because it sounds like what you were saying earlier, David, is that you mentor people even from that pre PhD. Like I'm thinking of doing a PhD. Um, like how do I get on the right path? How do I choose? A, you know, you know it sounds like you're 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 kind of got quite quite a, a a fantastic program you've got going there. So everybody look into that. Uh, but, but, but another question: Some universities make it mandatory to have a minimum number of publications during a PhD to submit their thesis, while others don't. Um, publish or the work quality? What actually matters? Thanks. So the, so the question is, is are publications more important than the work quality? I'd say that I'd say that obviously the work quality is more important than just publishing like crazy. Um, but uh, I think maybe it's the case, and others can tell me what you think. Maybe it's the case that there's a requirement that you publish in order to push you to uh, be achieving certain sort of academic rigorous standards. And uh, you know, it's kind of making sure that by the time you do defend, you've actually been through the process of peer review had your work critiqued by other people a number of times um, and, and gotten used to a process. So it's probably just something they're putting in place, but I can understand how maybe uh, it feels frustrating at the time. Yeah. Yeah. If you are publishing in a high impact peer reviewed journal, there is usually a base level of quality uh, that you've got to hit. And this is one of the reasons we have systematic reviews, have Prisma checklists, observational studies now have strobe checklists. Um, there's a minimum set of quality standards uh, that that are being applied, and that may be why your institution is pushing this. I think that's a is uh, I think it's a really nice uh, way of proceeding. Um, yeah. Uh, are PhD scholarships a possible option, especially in Ireland? I mean, I don't know the details of it, but I certainly know that scholarships are out there. And having a, had a lot of friends with doing PhDs, um, I know that that you know getting a scholarship to do a PhD is certainly a possibility. That they are out there. Um, and I don't I, like. I'm not quite sure what the route is into finding them, but um, yeah. I, and 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 perhaps maybe we won't get into that now because we're going to run out of time soon. And we might just have a like part two of this discussion because like the number of questions are still streaming in, yeah. and we've been, we've been going for an hour. Um, Wow, there's a lot of questions. We're just not going to get to them all. These are these are good. These are important questions, Greg. This is just a. There's no space out there, uh, like quite like this in global health. Um, um, okay, how do you go about finding a good supervisor? Let, let me let me kick that down the down the road. I've I've got a great uh, training, free training, completely free. Drop me a line after, and I'll send that to you. Or Greg, we can maybe link it to the channel somehow if you want. Um, okay, uh, and we're going to do that. And um, there's one last question here. Lots of hearts. Oh, I love this question. There's a great one. <laughs> what I'm going to suggest is because there, there are just so many questions that have been lined up, we're never going to get to them all. Um, I'm going to suggest let's let's end it there. We maybe do a part two. Let's let's do this again. I think this is obviously something that people are super interested in, um, and. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll get back to the people that have submitted questions. I'll ask them if they will maybe store these questions up and make them the first questions we answer in a part two of this and just get back into it because there's just so much to get into. And maybe we'll do a deep dive on like, how do you find a scholarship and actually have some information about places you can go to and we, you know, we, 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 we can look into a little bit of those sorts of things. Um, anyway, any final words, Kale? Wisdom? Yep, I'm happy. Antipodes? <laughs> oh, very important. Uh, yeah. Final words of wisdom, yeah, let me Let me just add, so our Facebook group uh, with lots of valuable resources to to you in your journey is Fast Track Grad. Um, join, uh, take advantage of those resources and free trainings uh, available to you. Fast Track Grad, okay, on Facebook. Lots of free resources, you get access to David, the man, professor, it's all happening right there. Um, listen, thanks everybody for watching. I appreciate all the questions, they've been great. Thank you guys for participating as 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 as, as host of the show. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a great hour. Uh, people watching this, remember you can subscribe, join as a member, 
uh, share the video with others, uh, and a quick advert, learnmore365.com, I've got courses there, there's public health courses that are for free, and there's some research courses you can do if you're interested. Okay, other than that, take care, don't do drugs, always do your best, speak to you soon, take care, bye.